Howdy, folks. Uh, you might be confused who's on your screen right now, but it's, uh, well, I'll take off my hat. It's me, Mr. Ancharsky. Yeah, I'm in disguise because there's spirits uh, about and it's very spooky um, because it's when it's when the spirits of the world come to, to dance among the living. Woo! It's Halloween. Anyway, uh, welcome back to AP World History. This is uh, continuing on of chapter one of unit three. And we're going to continue looking at the response to the Protestant Reformation. And we're going to first look at how the Catholic Church will respond to the Protestant Reformation. And then we will pay attention to uh, kind of how secular leaders are responding. And as I'm going to present, more using the Reformation for their own purposes. Let's take a look first at the Catholic Church. Let's take a look at how the Catholic Church is using the Reformation uh, in order to kind of secure its religious authority in what remains of Catholic countries of Europe. That was enough stalling for me. Here we go. So let's take a look at the Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation, a historical event we refer to as the Counter or Catholic Reformation, it is sometimes called. So the Counter-Reformation essentially is going to be a historical development in which the Catholic Church is going to develop and reaffirm its theology to resist the expanding influence of Protestantism. So essentially, the way to think of the Catholic Reformation or the Counter-Reformation is how do we stop the Protestant Reformation? Well, as we're going to see in a second, it's mostly going to be this idea of we need to prove we are better than the Protestants. And let's see how the Catholic Church will respond to the Protestant Reformation. Well, first things first, Catholics are going to get together. They're members of the clergy, so members of the kind of upper uh, the, the, the elites, you could say, of the Catholic clergy. They're going to get together at a council in the city of Trent. And essentially what they're going to do at this council is they're going to clarify point by point that Catholic teachings are correct, Protestant ones are wrong, essentially. So the Council of Trent is an example of the Catholic Church reaffirming what their beliefs are. So they're going to reaffirm that the Pope is the really the one in charge. So there's cool. You're going to see that... Um, uh, the Catholic Church is going to clarify its theology. It's going to clarify that, yes, our religion is based on the Bible and tradition, and that the Pope has the absolute authority to decide that. So the Council of Trent is going to do that. It's also going to kind of clarify the rules to prevent corruption a little bit. It is going to uh, ensure that priests have to be literate and trained. They're going to set up what we call seminary schools or basically kind of priest schools. How do I become a priest? So the Council of Trent, essentially, their whole, the whole purpose of it and what you would need to know is that it is clarifying Catholic theology. You wouldn't need to know the specific things that they're correcting, but they are kind of challenging Luther's criticism of the church. And they're saying that the church is supreme in that matter. But we're also going to see that the Catholic Church, and more accurately, the Catholic nations of Europe, are going to utilize the Inquisition increasingly more as a result of the Reformation. Remember, we kind of introduced the Inquisition with the Spanish during that rise of new monarchs. Well, the Spanish Inquisition is only one of several Inquisitions that are out there. There's a Roman one. There's a French one. And essentially, an inquisition is designed by the Catholic Church to root out suspected heretics or non-Catholics in Catholic countries. So we are going to see kind of persecution, a purging of non-Catholics in places like Spain and France and parts of Italy. Uh, we will see primarily the inquisition target uh, people like Jews and Muslims, but also Protestants, also people who aren't practicing Christianity the correct way, but also, as we'll talk about more in our next chapter, individuals who write things that criticize Catholic theology, including, as we're going to see in chapter two, scientists as well. So the Inquisition is going to kind of root out people who could oppose the Catholic Church. Oftentimes, that's going to be religious minorities, 
but also it could be any intellectual opposed to the teachings of the Catholic Church. And before we look at the final one, kind of another way the Catholic Church is exuding, exerting, I should say, its influence is through the creation of art. And art, as you kind of will see throughout AP World, essentially is propaganda. It's a demonstration, in this case, of the power and wealth of the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church is going to primarily be one of the main patrons of a movement in art called Baroque, Baroque, or excuse me, Baroque art. And you wouldn't need to know the exact details of what Baroque art is, but what is important is that it is a form, a demonstration of how the Catholic Church is trying to affirm its authority. And you can see an example of Baroque art down here on the bottom of the screen, kind of the leftermost one. This is a statue of a saint, I believe, who is uh, basically driving out pagans or non-Christians from the light of my boy, God. Um, but it's kind of a clear propaganda message because right here, oh shoot, because you know, this is a figure who probably represents the Catholic Church, and clearly these are people who are opposed to the Catholic Church, who are looking up to the glory and wonder of Christianity as the Catholic Church understands it. So Baroque essentially is kind of, um, essentially, it's a way to show to other people that the Catholic Church is still influential and powerful. It still has the money to build all this expensive art. It's a demonstration kind of to make people more attracted to the wealth and power that the Catholic Church has, even though at this point it's kind of declining. But perhaps the most important thing that will come out of the Counter-Reformation, out of the Catholic Reformation, is going to be a desire to spread Catholicism everywhere. Basically, the thought process is we got to get more Catholics than we have to convert more people to Catholicism, otherwise there will be more Protestants. And this is going to lead to the Catholic Church being a lot more aggressive in expanding Christianity, specifically, I should say, Catholicism. So we will see that both the Catholic Church, but mostly the Catholic monarchs of Western Europe, places like Spain, France, and Portugal, they're going to be very active in promoting the spread of Catholicism, especially because at this time, Europe is setting up colonies in North and South America. Europe is entering the Indian Ocean trade. So we will see that Catholic countries, primarily places like Spain, Portugal, and France, they're going to be very active in trying to spread Catholicism. And the Catholic Church will help all of this out by creating a new monastic order, a new order of priests known as the Jesuits or the Society of Jesus, as it's sometimes called. The founder is this dude named Ignatius Loyola. But the Jesuits are very important because they are going to be kind of the primary missionary body of the Catholic Church. Jesuits are going to be found wherever Catholic countries have access to. So we are going to see Jesuits being really responsible for promoting the spread of Catholicism around the world, especially in the Americas, so places where Spain and Portugal are setting up colonies, the Indian Ocean, places where Spain and Portugal are setting up trading presences, and Africa, same thing with the Indian Ocean. So the Jesuits kind of connect uh, the importance of the Counter-Reformation to wider world history and a connection to local history for you Tucsonans out there, to you American patriots out there, we are going to see actually the Jesuit presence in places like Tucson, which at this time, about the 1600s, 1700s more accurately, we do have uh, this area of the, of the New World colonized by Spain, as we'll talk about more in Unit 4. And one example is the mission of San Javier del Bac. And that's the image right there. It originally was a Jesuit uh, missionary post uh, founded by uh, Father Kino, Estebulio Kino, who was a Jesuit missionary. But outside even of the Americas, we will see Jesuits in places like Mughal, India. So we will have a Christian presence, especially where Europeans live in India, especially along the coast. 
Uh, we also see Jesuit missionaries in China and Japan, but Chinese and Japanese people aren't really going to like the Jesuits, as we will see more in Unit 4. Awesome. All right, let's keep going. So we're going to look now at kind of the politics of the Reformation. How is the politic, how, excuse me, how is the Reformation impacting secular politics? Well, as you can see in the map right here, Europe is going to be extremely divided. We've got Lutherans in the north. We've got Presbyterians, which are a type of Calvinist. We've got the Reformed Church in the Netherlands, again, a type of uh, Calvinist. We've got Anglicans in Britain, as we'll see. But we're going to see kind of how all of these different religions are going to greatly impact the political situation of Europe. So these are some general trends that I'm going to present to you. And one of the most general is the fact that European rulers and European political figures across Western Europe are going to essentially use the Reformation as an excuse to get more power for themselves. All of these religious debates, eh, they don't really matter all that much to Christian rulers. What does matter is what can I gain from the Reformation? And essentially, we see kind of this expressed in different ways. Among the nobility, especially in places like France and the Holy Roman Empire, we are going to see that Protestant nobles will use the Reformation, will use the religious controversy as a way to legitimize their opposition to Catholic monarchs. So places like France and the Holy Roman Empire have Catholic monarchs. And these Catholic monarchs, they embody those trends of new monarchs. They are assuming more power for themselves, and that power comes at the expense of the nobility. So how do you, as a noble, resist this centralization? Well, you join a different religion. You become a Lutheran. You become a Calvinist. You become something other than the uh, Catholic monarch. So kind of religion will be used as a justification for different groups of people taking a stance against Catholic new monarchs. And we'll also see how England embodies this trend, because the English government essentially is going to make their own religion, as we'll talk about in just a second. But Catholic monarchs are as well are using the Reformation also as an excuse primarily to get rid of anyone who doesn't fit in the kind of conformity that these new monarchs want to establish. So Spain is the prime example of that. We saw the Spanish Inquisition, but guess what? Protestant Reformation's happening. Let's up the scale. Let us increase our persecution of not just Jews and Muslims, suspected Jews and Muslims, but Protestants and non-traditional Catholics as well. But we also see that kind of Catholic monarchs in places like France and the Holy Roman Empire, they are going to use kind of institutions like the Inquisition to get rid of their political enemies. So France, especially as we will see, the French monarchs, they're going to try to impose Catholic conformity. But uh, nobles will resist that. The nobles turn to Protestantism. And the Catholic monarchy used the Inquisition to get rid of their most heinous supporters. But something that is going to be interesting, especially by the end of the Protestant Reformation, especially by the mid-1600s, is that we are going to see that even though a lot of conflicts will supposedly begin because of religion, there's more kind of political things going on that motivate these different wars of religion. So essentially kind of different things will happen, mostly kind of ex the excuse for why things will happen, such as various wars, will be religion. But the real goal is to kind of get back at um, a geopolitical rival. So we are going to see that largely foreign policy during this time is going to be less motivated by religion and more motivated by who should be the top dog in Europe. So we are going to see instances where two Catholic nations will go to war with each other, not because of religion, but because both are opposed to the other. 
And the prime example of that, as we will see, is France. France during the Thirty Years' War, which initially was basically a civil war between Protestants and Catholics, France is actually going to side with the Protestants. And it's mostly because France is using that war as an excuse to take away power from the Holy Roman Empire, as we'll see in a second. So that's what I mean by religion is the excuse, power is the goal. So we are going to see kind of a big change, at least from events like the Crusades. The Crusades, you could argue, were mostly driven by a religious desire for places like Jerusalem. But as we're going to see with the Thirty Years' War especially, that while religion might kind of have played in causing the war, the involvement of secular leaders is more complicated. So religion, not necessarily the determining factor in foreign policy. But we're also going to see that, especially as a result of all these wars that were happening, we are going to see that uh, secular leaders are going to actually appeal towards religious tolerance as a way to keep the peace. If religion is a cause for infighting, well, why not just make everybody able to practice their own religion? And we'll talk about that term balance of power in a second, but essentially it's the idea that no one country, no one state should be more powerful than all the others. So let's look at kind of more concrete examples by what I mean by all these things. So first and foremost, let's look at the French wars of religion. Well, the French wars of religion essentially was a civil war within France between the Catholic monarchy, the Valois family, as they're called, you wouldn't need to know that, and against Protestant nobles. These Protestants belong to a specific branch of Calvinism called the Huguenots. And essentially, we are going to see that despite the best efforts of the French monarchy to centralize power at the expense of the nobility, we are going to see that nobles will resist, and we do see a civil war in France, largely along Protestant versus Catholic lines. And it is going to be a very bloody affair. We are going to see instances of violence between Calvinists, between Protestants, I should say, and Catholics. One of the most egregious is the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Essentially, what happens is two Protestant nobles got married. And how does the Catholic monarchy respond? Well, they kill everybody at the wedding. It is an attempt to get rid of political rivals, but it's done in the atmosphere of religious controversy between Protestants and Catholics. Eventually, the Catholic monarchy wins. However, to kind of ease tensions within France, how is the monarchy going to respond under this guy named Henry II, I believe? Well, how is he going to respond? He's going to respond by saying, ah, as long as you promise to pay your taxes, as long as you promise not to go to war with the monarchy, you can practice whatever the f flip you want to. So whatever religion you would want to practice, be it Protestant, be it Catholic, practice whatever the heck you want. Jews, and eh, there's no religious freedom for them yet. But if you're a Christian, good for you. You can practice whatever branch of Christianity you want, as long as you're not a Cathar, but we'll talk about that in a second. So we do kind of see that the Edict of Nantes is a demonstration of religious tolerance as a way to maintain stability. A big theme in Unit 3 is how do states practice religious tolerance if they do? So France is actually going to do that. They are going to practice tolerance of different Christian faiths, of Protestants and Catholics, as a way to ease tensions between them. So we do kind of see that religion is less important, uh, kind of, as a motivating factor for internal rebellions. It's more about resisting centralization. Another big conflict, and one that I mentioned earlier, is the Thirty Years' War, which initially is going to begin as a conflict within the Holy Roman Empire, between the monarchy, the Holy Roman emperors, who are Catholic and buddy buddies with the Catholic Church, and nobles, who don't want to give up power to the Holy Roman Emperor. So we are going to see that initially there is this conflict about uh, the Holy Roman Empire saying, you all have to be Catholic. I'm literally uh, appointed by the Pope, who's the head of the Catholic Church. I can't have you being Protestant. 
However, the war goes on. It devastates this. Uh, it devastates the Holy Roman Empire. About 80 million people will die because of this conflict. But increasingly, the war is going to be less and less about religion because France is actually going to get involved. And France gets involved not because they are in favor of Protestantism. They are not. But they are in favor of knocking down the influence of the Holy Roman emperors. They are interested in curbing or limiting the power of the Holy Roman Empire, which is led by a family we'll talk about more uh, in two chapters, the Habsburgs. So we largely do see that, again, religion, not a big deal in considering foreign policy because France's motivation was not to help the Lutherans because the, Catholic, because the French agreed with them. No, it wasn't because of that. It was because France was looking for an excuse to limit the power of a rival, in this case, the Holy Roman Empire. But much like with the French wars of religion, we are going to see eventually kind of a compromise, a stalemate is reached between the Catholics and the Protestants in the Holy Roman Empire. And that in order to maintain the stability of the Holy Roman Empire, which is a very difficult job to do, but guess how they're going to try and do that? It's through religious tolerance. The war is going to end with something called the Treaty of Westphalia. It's important in European history. But essentially what comes out of this treaty is that if you're a Catholic noble, you can practice what you want. You can say that everyone in your country, everyone in your area has to be a Catholic or a Protestant. That's fine. But if you're a Catholic noble, you have to say that everyone has to be a Catholic. So it is kind of giving a choice to nobles what different religion they could be. They could be a Lutheran. They could be a Catholic. They can't be Jewish. That's not allowed. But at least for Christians, we do see a degree of religious tolerance. So it's a way to keep the peace. Religious tolerance is a way to keep different factions from killing each other, essentially. So we looked at kind of how religion is impacted uh, by the Protestant Reformation in terms of foreign policy. Let's take a look at kind of how Protestant countries, the biggest being England, how they're going to use the Reformation as an excuse to assume greater power for themselves. And the prime example is England. And that is the Anglican Reformation. If you are a fan of the musical Six, this is basically the plot of all of that. So the Anglican Reformation actually happens for a stupid reason. Basically, Henry VIII... Basically, Henry VIII... Uh, hold on, uh, my computer died or something. Uh, Henry VIII was this dude, right? Uh, he was the king of England. And uh, Henry VIII, okay, he was a dude. Um, he looked like fat bastard, but he couldn't have a son. He probably had syphilis or something. He, all he could have was daughters with his wife, guy or hmm, a girl named uh, Catherine of Aragon. However, that being said, uh, uh, Henry VIII uh, found a very attractive lady named Anne Boleyn and was like, hmm. What if I could make a son with her? That would be pretty chill. But I'm married to this lady from Spain. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to try to get a divorce. Well, guess what, Henry VIII? You can't get a divorce in Catholicism. That sucks. The Pope is like, no, dude, you have a wife. I will grant you an annulment if you want, but it's not the same thing as a divorce. Uh, but that's, geez, Louise. Cancel. Jeez, Louise. Oh my God, it's so funny. All right. Anyway, the Anglican church uh, basically pops up uh, because Henry VIII wanted to get a divorce with his wife. Well, he got it because he broke away from the Catholic church. Yeah, that's basically it. He's going to start his own religion. And guess who's in charge of the Anglican or Church of England? Uh, it is Henry VIII. It is the kings and queens of England. So we do see that kind of as a way to secure his succession that Henry VIII is going to start his own religion, essentially. And yet Anglicanism at this point under Henry VIII is not really a serious, I don't want to say serious religion, but it is not a, it's not that different from Catholicism at this point. The only big difference is that the leader of that church is not the Pope, but it's the King of England. Uh, and this is kind of a, a phrase that my AP Euro teacher, my uh, college professors associated with it, but essentially Henry VIII 
uh, practice what we call diet Catholicism. Uh, he is practicing Catholicism. The only difference is he's in charge, not the Pope. Eventually, we do kind of see some Protestant ideas being thrown in there, but again, kind of the idea of having a king be in charge of the religion that stays the same. So we do see kind of more Protestant theology thrown in with Elizabeth I, who is Henry VIII's daughter. Uh, Elizabeth I is going to create her uh, uh, a special kind of book of prayer uh, for the Anglican Church. And it's going to add a lot more Protestant stuff. However, there's not enough Protestant stuff for some people, including a group of Calvinists in England called the Puritans. The Puritans, we'll talk about them a little bit more in Unit 4. You talk about them a lot more in A-Push. Essentially, they're going to look to create a more distinctly Protestant, a more distinctly Protestant form of Anglicanism. And they will succeed uh, because they're going to leave England and go to your uh, go to the New World. Anyway, that's cool. I'm so mad. How is the Catholic Church responding to the Protestant Reformation? How are secular leaders responding to the Protestant Reformation? Use examples. All right, last things last. Let's talk about folk religion. Because we talked a lot changes, a lot of changes. But what is staying the same? Well, what is staying the same is how everyday people practice some forms of Christianity. And we're going to look at something known as folk religion. What is the religion of the people in a certain area? Well, folk Christianity essentially is something that will kind of stay the same across Western Europe, especially during this time. But what is folk Christianity? Well, essentially, folk Christianity is a combination of Christian teachings and pre-Christian ones, so pagan teachings. So we will kind of see that there is this belief across all levels of society, rich and poor, that magic and superstitious acts are legitimate things. So it is kind of a, recon it's a combination of both these pagan ideas and Christian teachings, because everyone's a Christian. Well, I mean, most people are Christian. But in addition to that, they believe in things like superstition. They believe in things like magic and astrology. Um, I'm not going to make that joke. All right. So essentially, we do kind of see the blending of pagan and Christian beliefs. This is something that will continue even during the Protestant Reformation and even well into the 19th century. So folk Christianity includes belief in things like magic, that magic is an explanation for the world, outside kind of of religious ideas. And we also do see an importance of magical figures like witches. Witches, according to kind of folk traditions, I'm so mad, folk traditions, are healers. They are magical he he healers. They oftentimes are midwives. They oftentimes are uh, medicine makers. They are important figures because in many of these villages because they hold kind of a important role as healers. Uh, magic is something you can't discount during this time. I'm not saying that you know witches and wizards are real, but amongst many people in Western Europe, they definitely are. However, we're going to see in a second how the Protestant Reformation is going to add some spice into all of this. Uh, there's a good video from Crash Course European History about witchcraft. Uh, yeah. Stop. Stop it. All right. I'm so mad. All right. So let's see how the Protestant Reformation is impacting folk religion. Because while ideas of magic and witchcraft are going to continue, how is the Reformation impacting them? Well, essentially, we do kind of see a clampdown on these untraditional Christian practices through institutions like the Inquisition. Remember, the Catholic Church during the Counter-Reformation is looking to consolidate its power. It's looking to ensure there is conformity amongst all of its practitioners, amongst all of its uh, followers. So we do see that the Catholic Church is going to be especially against instances of untraditional Christianity. We will see the Inquisition being used to target not just Jews and Muslims. Stop texting me. We are going to see uh, people. Ah! We are going to see that the Catholic Church is going to clamp down on Protestants. Catholic, or we are going to see that the Catholic Inquisition will clamp down. 
clamp down on untraditional practices in the Catholic Church, including witches, but also a group of non-traditional Christians called Cathars. Cathars are going to be persecuted by the Inquisition. I'm very mad. All right. So the Catholic Church is looking to seek conformity. It's going to clamp down on untraditional people, including witches and untraditional Cath uh, Christians. But we are also going to see that this atmosphere of warfare is going to make people very tense, just like I am right now. It's going to make people very anxious. So when there's periods of anxiety, people look for groups of people to blame. Oh, my God. Half of my village got burned down because of the 30 years war. Oh, no. I just starved to death because of the famine. My, my children are dying. That's terrible. Who caused all of this? So we are going to see that this atmosphere of religious conflict is going to bring out kind of the worst in people. We are going to see that in order to kind of blame somebody for all the devastation going on, they're going to target anyone, especially marginalized groups, Jews, Muslims, untraditional Christians, but also witches. We are going to see that this is weird period in European history where there's going to be a witchcraft hunt craze. We do see that Witches, or suspected witches, I should say, largely older women, largely older unmarried women, so women who don't fit the model of what a woman should be, they're going to be targeted as a result of this increased superstition and anxiety during the early modern period. The early modern period has a lot of anxiety things going on. There's the wars of religion. There's all that going on. There's this transition towards capitalism that we'll talk about more on Friday. Uh, so people are looking for uh, them to blame, and they blame witches. Awesome. Ah! Oh, my God. I'm so mad at this computer. Anyway, Monty Python did a funny thing on this. How are we seeing continuity and change and how people practice Christianity? Awesome. Have a great day. I'm so mad. Bye.